Two, the conflict of interests. We have seen some of the social implications of the modern worldview as it expresses itself in Darwinism and the myth of evolution. All of these aspects cited have very serious consequences for education. There is still another basic factor that radically colours all of life and education and which has substantially altered the world, namely the idea of conflict as necessary, inescapable and inevitable. In Darwinism, this idea of conflict is called the struggle for survival and natural selection. In The Descent of Man, Darwin, among other things, had this to say about the matter. I have hitherto only considered the advancement of man from a semi-human condition to that of the modern savage. But some remarks on the action of natural selection on civilised nations may be worth adding. The subject has been ably discussed by Mr. W. R. Gregg and previously by Mr. Wallace and Mr. Galton. Most of my remarks are taken from these three authors. With savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated, and those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. We civilised men, on the other hand, do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed and the sick. We institute poor laws, and our medical men exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. There is no reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who, from a weak constitution, would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. Thus, the weak members of civilised societies propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. It is surprising how soon a want of care, or care wrongly directed, leads to the degeneration of a domestic race. But excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. For Darwin, social progress is thus a product of natural selection. We do not have space here to analyse the myth of the superior health of the savage, which is a product of this idea, or the fact that the idea that natural selection is necessarily operative in primitive cultures is an illusion. Our concern is with the effects of this idea on our culture. Before considering these effects, we should also note that Darwin was aware of the offence of this idea to Christian morality, and he tried often to nullify that offence, to affirm the need for traditional virtues, and to retain some ethics in the face of his totally mindless universe. He tried to save morality by positing social instincts which brought men together. However, According to natural selection, it was might which brought men together, the more powerful members of the pack governing and using the weaker. Carlyle, as a Hegelian like Darwin, was more consistent in applying this principle, and Darwin was horrified. Of Carlyle, Darwin wrote, His views about slavery were revolting. In his eyes, might was right. End quote. As we have seen, Darwin had said, I look upon all human feeling as traceable to some germ in the animals. End quote. This view, however, had been privately expressed to his cousin. Publicly, he did not dare to dismiss all possibility of any morality. Victorian society did not want Christianity, but it did want some kind of traditional morality to protect against anarchy. Thus, as Darwin developed the idea of natural selection in The Descent of Man, he was careful to reassure his readers, Looking to future generations, there is no cause to fear that the social instincts will grow weaker, and we may expect that virtuous habits will go stronger, becoming perhaps fixed by inheritance. In this case, the struggle between our higher and lower impulses will be less severe, and virtue will be triumphant. How ready Darwin's age was to believe the myth is apparent in this passage and in the fact that the entire edition of On the Origin of Species sold out on the day of publication, November 24, 1859. 
In the above passage, Darwin converted the idea of might and natural selection into a wonderful moral and social instinct. Then, in radical contradiction to his theory, he posited the inheritance of acquired characteristics, an idea that was often slipped into his theory. Conflicts could not be eliminated from Darwinism by these subterfuges, and the idea of conflict quickly became a part of society. It already had deep roots in the Hegelian doctrine of cultural evolution. The idea of class conflict was and is basic to socialism. This is why, among other things, Marx and Engels were overjoyed at the publication of On the Origin of Species. Once Darwin's premise of conflict became a scientific fact, socialism would become the inevitable form of society. Historic capitalism also underwent a radical change under the influence of Darwin and Spencer. Social Darwinism applied the idea of conflict and the survival of the fittest to the marketplace, and the true market theory of the harmony of interests gave way to a socialistic premise of conflict which soon undercut capitalism. The idea of the conflict of interests was first proposed by the tempter in the Garden of Eden. God, he held, was concealing the true facts from man, lest man become a rival God. God was foisting an idea of the harmony of interests on man, so that man would be content to live in ignorance and continue in subservience to God. The universe, Satan's premise implied, is one of total conflict, with many gods possible, each striving against the other for total freedom. Such a theory means that the weak must fall, that the strong must seek greater strength, and either by confrontation or guile, the would-be God must seek autonomous power and authority in all things. The result of the tempter's thesis was, first of all, conflict between man and God, second, conflict between man and man, and third, conflict within the soul of man. The law of God and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ affirm, as against this, a different goal, the overcoming of the conflict of interests by, first, harmony between God and man through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, second, harmony between man and man by means of God's grace and in terms of his laws, and third, peace in the soul of man by means of the Holy Spirit indwelling the redeemed. Now, as we examine this school curricula, we can see a vast difference between the worldview of Darwinism and its theory of conflict and the Bible and its doctrine of harmony. In the sciences, the conflict idea gives us not only the survival of the fittest, but also a view of the universe as a dead, hostile place, mindless and alien to man. Man is an accident, as is the universe, and there is no meaning or purpose to anything. Only the ugly conflict of man with his will to survive against a universe which is totally thoughtless of man. As against this, the Bible declares in Psalm 19 that the God, who is man's redeemer, is the giver of the law and the creator of all nature, so that there is a perfect harmony in all things, because God is perfect in all his ways. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heavens, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and a honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? 
Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. This is not a scientific account the psalmist gives us, but it is still more accurate than the modern scientific view. Bert gave a very telling account of the mechanical and cold universe that man began to see after Newton. Quote, Newton's authority was squarely behind that view of the cosmos which saw in man a puny, irrelevant spectator, so far as being wholly imprisoned in a dark room can be called such, of the vast mathematical system whose regular motions, according to mechanical principles, constituted the world of nature. The gloriously romantic universe of Dante and Milton, that set no bounds to the imagination of man as it played over space and time, had now been swept away. Space was identified with the realm of geometry, time with the continuity of number. The world that people had thought themselves living in, a world rich with colour and sound, redolent with fragrance, filled with gladness, love and beauty, speaking everywhere of purpose of harmony and creative ideals, was crowded now into minute corners in the brains of scattered organic beings. The really important world outside was a world hard, cold, colourless, silent and dead, a world of quantity, a world of mathematically computable motions in a mechanical regularity. The world of quantities, as immediately perceived by man, became just a curious and quite minor effect of that infinite machine beyond. In Newton, the Cartesian claim for serious philosophical consideration finally overthrew Aristotelianism and became the predominant worldview of modern times. End quote. Cold as Newton's worldview was, there was still room in it for God as the great mathematician. In Darwin's worldview, there was only nature, red in tooth and claw, mindless and beset with total conflict in the struggle for survival. Darwin had grounds for believing in the harmony of interests because of his study of earthworms and their work, but he chose to accept the idea of the conflict of interests. The cold, dead and hostile universe of Darwin is a myth. The world of Psalm 19 gives us the harmony of all things in and under God. So great is this harmony that, as the psalmist declared, Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. Psalm 76.10 Contrary to Darwin, the socialists and modern philosophy, there is no metaphysical conflict of interests in the universe. There is only an ethical conflict between covenant-breaking man and his God, but the sovereign God nullifies this conflict and makes it work together for good, Romans 8.28, and to his glory. The whole universe and all things therein move Psalm 19 affirms to glorify God. His purpose governs it absolutely and gives harmony to all things in terms of his sovereign decree. The textbooks in the sciences, as elsewhere, must thus be rewritten in terms of the biblical doctrine of God as the creator whose purpose establishes harmony and meaning. The Christian school cannot perpetuate the views of degenerate and metaphysically alien sciences. Similarly, in economics and history, the conflict of interest theory leads to radical statism. It is assumed that there is no economic law inherent in God's universe and that man, through the state, must establish an order where none exists. The result is socialism. It is also taught that history is class struggle rather than account of sin and man's rejection of God's harmony in favour of his own autonomy. Again, In the teaching of grammar today, it is held that grammar is an arbitrary invention and increasingly in the status schools, any kind of expression is permitted and in fact approved. To follow the rules is to be repressive to the creative instinct. The comments of George Steiner on grammar is instructive at this point. An explicit grammar is an acceptance of order. 
it is a hierarchization, the more penetrating for being enforced so early in the individual lifespan of the forces and valuations prevailing in the body politic, the tonalities cognate. The sinews of Western speech, closely enacted and in turn stabilized, carried forward the power relations of the Western social order. Gender differentiations, temporal cuts, the rules governing prefix and suffix formations, the synapses and anatomy of a grammar, these are the figura, at once ostensive and deeply internalized, of the commerce between the sexes, between master and subject, between official history and utopian dream in the corresponding speech community. End quote. Thus, while Steiner believes that grammar is an acceptance of order, end quote, he believes that this order is relative to its culture. True, anything in history is by that fact relative, but is it only relative? With this, the Christian cannot agree. The facts of time and relativity in time are God-created facts. First, all speech has an inescapable time structure because man lives in time. Again, second, all grammar or all speech has an order to convey the meaning, relationship and sequence of things in time. Third, all speech, all words, are propositional. Certain things are affirmed and delimited. Every word is a proposition, and every form of grammar is a propositional statement. Fourth, language and grammar are geared to reality and communication, and a lie or a falsehood defeats the function of language. Fifth, we must believe that language exists because God exists, and God, having created man in his image, has chosen to communicate with man and to give man an infallible word. In Matthew 22.32, our Lord rests an important doctrine and its truth on the grammatical tense of God's word. Because Darwinianism teaches a conflict of interests, it is not surprising that we have what is evasively called a generation gap, or, more accurately, a war between parents and children, teachers and pupils, the old and the young. We also have more racial conflict than the world has ever known. In contrast, the Christian school, where faithful to its calling, brings harmony to the generations and between person and person, not in terms of the humanistic ideas of love, but in terms of the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. It is an imperative, therefore, that the Christian school curriculum work towards an entirely new kind of textbook and teaching, one furthering not the conflict of interests, but the harmony of all interests under God,